You're on mute, I think, Margo. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> so I did say on mute uh, that uh, wait another minute here and then we'll get started on today's webinar, which is follow up monitoring for the NPD closure project. Okay, so we have 20 attendees right now and uh, we may have some late joiners, but I'll just get started. So thank you for joining us today and welcome to our first webinar of 2021. And it's on the NPD Closure Project. My name is Margot Thompson and I support communications for the NPD Closure Project at Canadian Nuclear Laboratories or CNL. And we're doing something different today. We're adding a few polls to check in with all of you here. And so before I introduce Juliet, who is our speaker this afternoon, we want to see if some of the people here today know about the MPD Closure Project. Perhaps you've attended previous webinars. So I'm just gonna get this poll going. Okay, so this is our first time doing this, so it's, bear with me, it should be fun though. Okay, I'll leave it open for a couple more seconds. Looks like mostly everybody has voted though. So the vast majority is very familiar. Well, either way, you'll be more familiar soon. Um, that's great. Today, Juliette Louise, uh, an environmental analyst with the NPD Closure Project team will be going over the draft fault monitoring plans for the NPD Closure Project, as I said before. And our next poll question, we're gonna see how familiar everyone here today is with CNL's environmental monitoring program. And we'll just leave that up there for about 40 seconds. We've got some new joiners too. We've got 24 attendees here today. Okay. So I was gonna let it go on a bit longer, but I think mostly everybody has voted. And it looks like everybody kind of falls somewhere in the middle. So Hopefully we'll be all be a little bit more familiar about the, the monitoring program, at least at that NPD site by the end of this presentation. So I'll just share those results. Okay. All right. So you're welcome to ask questions at any point during the presentation. And uh, we'll have the question and answer session after Juliet's presentation. And she'll be then joined by three other uh, individuals, Katie Hogue, who's the manager of regulatory approvals for the project, Christine Gallagher, who's the manager of the environmental protection program at uh, CNL, and Brian Wilcox, who's the director of the project. And before I hand it over to Juliet, I'd like to go over a couple of logistics. So the webinar is available in both French and English. Um, for those of you uh, who joined a bit later, I believe uh, we shared that earlier. And you can choose your language of preference through the earth icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And then the Q&A icon as well for questions is at the bottom of the screen too. And after the webinar, we will send out a short survey to all, webin all attendees to get feedback on how you found today's webinar. And then to offer the opportunity if you have any more questions too. And as usual, we'll post the webinar to YouTube in the next few days. Okay, so with that, Juliet, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Marco. 
So uh, the topic for today's webinar is follow-up monitoring um, for the NPD closure project. Follow-up monitoring is essentially monitoring of the environment to confirm the predictions of the Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS. For the NPD closure project, the EIS predicts that the project would have minimal impact on the environment, so follow-up monitoring will be used to confirm that prediction. So in this presentation, I'll begin with a brief overview of where NPD is located, uh, a bit about the history of the reactor and the objective of the NPD closure project. Then I'll describe some of the monitoring that we currently do at the site. I'll review the schedule for the NPD closure project, which is going through a federal environmental assessment. The project requires approval from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission before it can proceed. Then for the rest of the presentation, I will summarize the follow-up monitoring plans for the NPD closure project. I'll go over the timelines for monitoring and give some examples of what will be monitored and the monitoring locations and frequency. Then I'll describe the actions we could take if we get unexpected monitoring results. Then I'll wrap up the presentation by extending an invitation to anyone who's interested in participating in a workshop where we will review the details about the proposed monitoring to seek uh, input and feedback. So today's presentation will be at a pretty high level to give the big picture, and then the workshops are where we can delve into all the technical details. So the NPD site is along the Trans-Canada Highway, halfway between North Bay and Ottawa, and it's located on the south shore of the Ottawa River. The inset image shows a zoomed in view of the site with the Trans-Canada Highway running across the bottom and then the NPD main road that leads to the developed area of the site. Here's another view of the NPD property. Uh, the property boundary is outlined in yellow. The um, total area of the site is around 1,000 acres and the vast majority of the site is undisturbed forested land. The developed area of the site in this area here is about 10 acres, so it's about 1% of the total property area, and that's where the proper uh, project activities will take place. A bit about the history of the site. So NPD was the first nuclear reactor in Canada to put electricity to the grid. It operated from 1962 to 1987, and it was a 22 megawatt electric pressurized heavy water reactor. It was a training center for many operators and engineers of the Canadian nuclear industry. In 1987, after it completed its mission to show that nuclear power could be used to generate electricity in Canada, the reactor was placed in a safe shutdown state. There was then a first phase of decommissioning during which the reactor was defueled and drained. The fuel and heavy water were transferred to Chalk River Laboratories. The non-nuclear components and structures that were no longer needed were removed so for example, uh, the, there was a training center and some office buildings that were removed. And on the image on the right, you can see the concrete pads that remain where these buildings were once located. The NPD reactor building has been in a safe shutdown state for over 30 years. The government of Canada has um, asked CNL to accelerate the environmental remediation of nuclear sites with the objective of reducing Canada's nuclear legacy liabilities. Since there is no disposal facility available now or in the near future in Canada, in-situ disposal is a safe, effective way to achieve this outcome. So this slide describes graphically what in-situ disposal is all about. The image to the left shows the current state of the facility. Uh, to give an idea of scale, the deepest part of the facility extends to almost uh, 100 feet below ground within bedrock. The image at the bottom shows in situ disposal in progress. The existing concrete structure would remain in place. Some of the concrete walls of the facility are up to uh, eight or nine feet thick. The above ground portion of the building would be demolished and placed in the open spaces of the facility. And then the facility would be filled with grout, which is like a specially formulated concrete that flows very easily. And we would have a small batch plant on site to prepare the grout. The part of the facility that contains the nuclear structures would be covered with a concrete cap and then the whole footprint of the building will be covered with an engineered cover system with vegetation on top. The end result you can see on the right would be a uh, disposal facility at the NPD site. 
In situ disposal is protective of the environment because it contains and isolates the contaminants within the grouted facility. So on the right, you can see what the site will look like once demolition and grouting is complete. You can see that the stack will remain because it's the roosting site for chimney swift birds, which are a species at risk. Uh, the roost at NPD is one of the largest in Canada, so it's very important to us to retain the stack uh, as a roosting site for them. Now we'll give a, a few examples of some of the monitoring that takes place currently at uh, the NPD's NPD site and around the NPD site. Uh, the monitoring confirms that the public and environment around the NPD facility are protected. The map on the left shows where the Ottawa River is currently sampled for radioactivity, specifically tritium, gross beta, gross alpha, and cesium-137. Uh, Ottawa River water is sampled upstream at Dejuachim Dam and downstream at Deep River. So results show no difference between the upstream and downstream locations. For example, tritium is about three becquerels per liter, both upstream and downstream of NPD. For context, this is far below the Health Canada guidelines for drinking water quality, which is 7,000 becquerels per liter. The photo on the right shows two locations that we monitor on the NPD site. For waterborne emissions, we sample water that flows through a tile drain system that's installed below ground around the perimeter of the building. This tile drain diverts groundwater to the Ottawa River in order to keep the facility dry. Water is sampled from a manhole located over this tile drain twice a year for tritium in gross beta. And both of these parameters are less than 0.01% of their derived release limits. Airborne emissions from the ventilation stack are also monitored for tritium in gross beta. And again, both of these parameters are less than 0.01% of, of their derived release limits. Every year, a summary of monitoring results at NPD is posted on CNL's website. So from the homepage, if you simply click the link called performance reporting, you'll see a list of various performance reports for CNL. And there's a link there to the summary of uh, monitoring results for NPD for 2020. In terms of project schedule, uh, last month, the CNSC determined that additional information needs to be incorporated before the EIS and supporting documents can be considered a complete package. The main focus of improvements now is, an, is on Indigenous engagement. Once the EI, EIS is resubmitted to the CNSC, it will be posted on CNL's website, and we anticipate this to be within the next few months. After the CNSC determines that the submission is complete, the next step would be a 90-day technical review by the CNSC and expert federal and provincial authorities. The EIS will be revised again to address the technical comments, and right now we're aiming for the final EIS to be submitted near the end of this year. A two-part hearing would take place for the project, and pending favorable approval, the project could begin as early as fall 2022. So now the, the main focus of the presentation is follow-up monitoring. Uh, follow-up monitoring is a formal part of the federal environmental assessment process. Follow-up monitoring is used to confirm two things. Firstly, to confirm if the environmental impact of the project is in line with what is predicted in the EIS. And for the NPD closure project, the EIS predicts minimal impact on the environment. So follow-up monitoring will be used to confirm this. Secondly, follow-up monitoring is used to confirm that mitigation measures are working properly. An example mitigation uh, measure is misting for dust control. Incorporating public feedback and Indigenous knowledge is also a very important part of developing the follow-up monitoring plans. So when does follow-up monitoring start and end? Uh, follow-up monitoring begins essentially now before the project starts with the collection of baseline data which will give an idea of current environmental conditions so that we'll have something to compare future monitoring results to. Follow-up monitoring will continue throughout the decommissioning execution phase, which lasts roughly two years, and that's when the demolition, grouting, and installation of the cap and cover takes place. Monitoring will continue for the duration of the institutional control phase, which is a period of a minimum of 100 years, where active monitoring and surveillance will take place. And it's important to emphasize that the duration of institutional controls is a minimum of 100 years and that regulatory approval is required before this phase can be terminated. 
So the details of follow-up monitoring are separated into three documents with one document each for effluent, environmental and groundwater monitoring. The reason why there's three documents is because each document aligns with its respective CSA standard. The follow-up monitoring plans are draft right now uh, and they won't be finalized until the project is approved to proceed. There may be additional monitoring requirements as part of the CNSC's EA decision, and we would incorporate those into the plans before finalizing them. So in the next two slides, I'll just give a quick visual overview of some of the main monitoring activities during the two project phases. And then later on, I'll get into uh, some of these monitoring activities in a little bit more detail. So first for the decommissioning execution phase, when demolition, grouting and installing the cap and cover takes place, the effluent monitoring plan describes how emissions directly from the project site would be monitored. So as long as air is emitted from the stack, it will be monitored as we do today. We will monitor uh, dust in air and emissions to air from demolition activities. Air that's released from the facility as grout is placed inside the facility will be monitored. The washout pit would be a small lined pit in the batch plant area in this, uh, in this location here. And that would be used to rinse batch plant equipment. So that water will be sampled and managed according to sample results. So if there's any contamination, it would be sent to uh, the Chalk River site to be appropriately managed. The activities in green are described in the environmental monitoring plan. So for example, the Ottawa River will be monitored Noise from project activities will be monitored. Radiation in air is something we currently monitor now and we'll continue to monitor that. Chimney SWIFTS will be monitored to ensure the project activities don't have a negative impact on SWIFTS. And water from the tile drain is monitored now and we'll continue to do that throughout the decommissioning execution phase as well. The items in blue are part of the groundwater monitoring plan. Uh, the direction of groundwater is generally towards the river along the blue arrows. There are two groundwater monitoring wells located on the south side of the facility, and these will be used to monitor groundwater before it interacts with the grouted facility. And then there's a series of wells located between the facility and the river, and we would use these wells to monitor groundwater after it interacts with the facility. <clears throat> So in the institutional control phase, the main monitoring activities would be, so for environmental monitoring, again, Ottawa River water quality would be monitored, same as in the decommissioning execution phase. For chimney swifts, for three years following the completion of decommissioning activities, CNL will conduct weekly evening roost counts. And then after that, we will continue participating in the national roost count days which are five days a year when counts happen at all the known chimney swift roosts in Canada. And again, radiation in air will continue to be monitored. And then for groundwater monitoring in the institutional control phase, again, this is the direction of groundwater flow. The same wells that were used in the decommissioning execution phase will be used in the institutional control phase. So the two wells on the upstream side of the facility and then the series of wells between the facility and the river will be used for uh, groundwater monitoring. I'll get into a bit more detail on groundwater monitoring uh, later on in the presentation. So that was a very quick overview of some of the main monitoring activities happening during the two project phases. So now I'll get into a bit more detail on some of these activities where we received a lot of interest and comments on the EIS. I'll describe the monitoring locations, frequency and parameters uh, for air quality and dust, groundwater, and Ottawa River water quality monitoring. And then I'll give some examples of uh, what we call secondary monitoring or triggered monitoring, and that's the extra monitoring that would take place if needed. I'll describe two examples of secondary or triggered monitoring. Um, firstly, monitoring of Ottawa River sediment, and then benthic macroinvertebrates. So air quality and dust will be monitored during the decommissioning execution phase. The project would interact with the uh, atmospheric environment in a few ways. Dust would be generated from demolition, operation of the batch plant, and assembly of the concrete cap and cover system. 
Also, as grout is emplaced inside the facility, it would displace the air that's inside the facility to the outside environment, so that would be monitored. The table at the bottom of the slide summarizes the plan for air quality and dust monitoring. The main monitoring location would be at the guardhouse, circled in yellow on the uh, photograph. That's the main entrance point to the fenced area around the NPD facility. This location was modeled in the EIS, so we have predicted air quality information that we can compare the monitoring results to. And it's also along the primary wind direction at, uh, at the NPD site. The plan is to use a high volume air sampler, which has filters to capture particles. Um, it will be run continuously and the filters will be analyzed on a monthly basis. So we'll monitor for various dust size particles as well as radioactivity and non-radioactive components like lead and asbestos, which may be released from the facility. Another important aspect of dust monitoring is visual monitoring. And that involves a lot of staff training and that will help with real-time monitoring. It'll help us quickly know when we need to apply more mitigation measures like misting for dust suppression. Visual monitoring is also very mobile, so staff can easily move around to ensure they observe all project activities that may generate dust. So this slide summarizes the plans for groundwater monitoring. The groundwater monitoring plan proposes that the two wells upgradient of the facility and 11 wells between the facility and the river will be monitored. Groundwater will be monitored for radioactivity and non-radioactive parameters of interest, including pH, mercury, lead, and PCBs. pH would be monitored because the grout is an alkaline substance, although no alkaline plume is expected from the facility. Lead would be monitored because there's lead shielding in the facility and for the other substances, there are very minor, minor residual amounts in the facility. So there's no significant impacts to groundwater predicted because in-situ decommissioning isolates and contains the contaminants within the grouted structure. So this monitoring is the way to confirm this prediction. The upper right corner of the map shows a table of well depths at which groundwater will be sampled to ensure that the groundwater that interacts with the facility is appropriately monitored. The usual frequency of monitoring would be twice a year in spring and fall, but there will be certain times that we'll do groundwater monitoring four times a year just to get more data. So we'll monitor uh, four times a year during the year that decommissioning is complete. So that will give a snapshot of the groundwater situation right after project activities are complete. And then another time we'll monitor four times a year is when the facility is expected to be saturated with groundwater, which is predicted to be roughly 40 years after grouting is complete. And in terms of baseline monitoring, we plan to start baseline monitoring um, for groundwater this year. And we'll just continue to monitor groundwater throughout the decommissioning execution phase and institutional control phase. Monitoring of the Ottawa River is an extremely important aspect of monitoring. During the decommissioning execution phase, the Ottawa River will be monitored right offshore of NPD, which is this yellow dot. And then the two dots downstream will be added on during the institutional control phase because that's the flow path that the groundwater would follow once it reaches the river. If you look at the map on the right, we'll also monitor the river upstream of NPD, NPD at the Dejwashim Dam and then downstream at Deep River. So as I mentioned earlier, CNL currently monitors um, radioactivity at these upstream and downstream locations, but we'll also add on monitoring for non-radioactive parameters as well. Uh, for example, lead, mercury, PCBs, pH. We plan to start baseline monitoring of the river at these locations in the near future at a frequency of four times a year, and then just continue with that monitoring throughout the decommissioning execution and institutional control phases. So I described monitoring of air quality, groundwater, and the Ottawa River. And those are the primary parts of the environment that will be monitored because those are the primary ways that the project could interact with the environment. And now we'll give two examples of secondary monitoring or triggered monitoring. So this is, this is additional monitoring of the environment that would be initiated if we see unexpected monitoring results in the primary monitoring. So in this slide, the examples I'll give are Ottawa River sediment and benthic macroinvertebrates. And those are good indicators for sediment quality because they are sensitive to contamination. 
So in the future, sediment monitoring would be triggered if we see unexpected results in surface water or groundwater. And monitoring of benthic macroinvertebrates would be triggered if there are exceedances in sediment monitoring. There was a co comprehensive baseline study of sediment in benthic macroinvertebrates last summer. So on the satellite photo, you can see five yellow transect lines extending into the river where the samples were taken. And then there was also one transect upstream at Rolfton above the dam and one at Deep River downstream. Sediment samples were monitored for radioactivity and non-radioactive parameters of interest and benthic macroinvertebrates were classified and the results are currently being compiled into a report. And then just to end off this slide, I added a few photos. So this is the tool they use to take grab samples from the river bottom. This is a photo of one of the sediment samples that they took from the boat. And this is a sample that was analyzed for benthic macroinvertebrates. Just jumping up back to the first photo here, you can see the NPD stack in the background there. So this was taken um, pretty close to the shore at NPD. The monitoring results would be compared to two things. Uh, the EIS predictions and also to standard benchmarks, which include provincial and federal benchmarks. If there is an exceedance, response actions would be initiated and the response will depend on the level of exceedance. So some response actions are monitoring again to confirm results, adding more monitoring locations, monitoring more environmental components, and that's the triggered monitoring or secondary monitoring, uh, pausing work, or implementing more mitigation measures. So although the EIS predicts minimal impact on the environment, uh, we still have to think about contingency plans if warranted by the monitoring results. So for example, uh, if groundwater monitoring results indicate that remediation is required, one possible remedy would be a um, pump and treat system where the groundwater would be pumped downstream of the facility and treated. An important part of the follow-up monitoring program is that it will be reviewed on a regular basis. So that typically happens about once a year. And during this review, the plans can be updated based on the monitoring results if needed. So monitoring locations, parameters, or frequencies can be modified with justification. Doing this annual review ensures that the plans adapt so that they stay relevant and meaningful over time. So I'll end off the presentation by extending an invitation to anyone who's interested in discussing the proposed monitoring activities in more detail. If you are interested in participating in a workshop, uh, if you could please send an email to our stakeholder relations group, so ermstakeholder at cnl.ca. We haven't finalized dates yet, but once we do, we will contact everyone who has expressed an interest in participating. Also, the three follow-up monitoring plans are available upon request. So if you wish to receive a copy, you can do so through the same email address. So that's the end of the presentation, just a very um, high-level overview of follow-up monitoring for the NPD closure project. Um, Margot, I'm not sure if we're having one more uh, polling question or if we're going straight to questions now. Hi, Juliet. We do have one more polling question, but I'm going to leave it till we do the question and answers. Um, so thank you. And we've already got three. So um, I'll just start going. So I did, I think I did forget to mention too that we do prefer if uh, attendees can ask their questions through the Q&A button at the bottom. And that's just the two uh, speaker bubbles that are, are down on your Zoom bar at the bottom there. Okay, so our first question, and I think you touched on this in the presentation, Juliet, would like to know why the CNSC returned CNLs and the NPD's draft EIS. What was incomplete and how long will it take for CNL to complete and return to the CNSC? They're looking for a bit more information on the NPD timeline. So I think you did touch on this, but maybe Katie can share a bit more information there. Yep. Good afternoon. Um, is everyone able to hear me okay? Great. Um, yep, I have no problem uh, responding on, on, on this one. 
So the um, letter from the CNSC to CNL with the results of the completeness check that came in January is available on the impact assessment registry. And I think Margo is gonna share the link while I'm speaking here. So you're free to uh, read that information yourself, uh, but I can do a bit of a synopsis. Essentially, the CNSC is looking for uh, a better document and record of the engagement that CNL has undertaken with Indigenous groups and how CNL has addressed issues and concerns that have been raised by the Indigenous groups. And they're looking for that information to be contained directly within our environmental impact statement, the, the main report. So we're working to improve uh, the way that we have documented that information. Uh, it does not result in a um, significant effort to do more engagement at this point. Um, a lot of the work has already been done. So it's really to present that information and include it all in the EIS uh, is the aspect the CNSC is looking for. Uh, the other thing to note about the uh, results of the completeness check is that in December when we resubmitted uh, there was 32 outstanding information requests that the CNSC was looking for CNL to improve. Uh, and the results in uh, January uh, is that there is only five remaining information requests uh, to address, uh, for CNL to address, and those are all related to uh, Indigenous engagement efforts. Okay. So. I did post that um, link to in the chat. Okay, so the next question we also touched on and it's about post closure. So if monitoring indicates a rise in levels above acceptable radioactive materials in water or air, what would CNL do next? What can CNL do when the site is encased in concrete and grout? Who would pay for the costs? Monitoring, uh, is good, but if something really has gone wrong, uh, it seems like a pretty tough task to remediate the situation. Yeah, so I will uh, take the first part of this question and then I will hand it off, um, I believe, to Brian to address the question about costs. So um, I touched on this a little bit during the presentation, um, but if there is um, a rise in levels above acceptable uh, quantities of radioactive materials. There are options we could take, uh, contingency plans, and uh, the example I gave during the presentation is a potential pump and treat system for groundwater. Uh, it's also important to note that the uh, follow-up monitoring outlines two levels of evaluating the results of monitoring. So the first uh, level that we would compare to is uh, either baseline levels or uh, the predictions in the EIS which are all below um, regulatory limits or uh, federal provincial bed benchmarks. So if we see um, anything above that level, we will start um, a response actions, monitoring more, doing supplementary monitoring, like the triggered monitoring I discussed. And then um, that will help ensure that we don't get to levels that exceed uh, regulatory limits. And then um, again, uh, contingency, contingency plans would be in place uh, if needed to remediate anything. And Brian, did you want to take the question about costs? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Juliet. Um, I'll just add, in addition to the information you gave to answer that question, I mean, if we did see a monitoring result that exceeded um, one of our benchmarks, <clears throat> probably the first thing we would do is increase both spatial and uh, and frequency of monitoring to just verify performance. And then based on that, we would implement a um, next steps action plan, which, which could include uh, a number of different methods of remediation if needed, as Juliet mentioned, like a pump and treat or a filtration wall. Um, well, it's, it's highly unlikely that that waste escapes a facility. Um, it is designed to ensure very good containment and isolation. Um, it, is a, it is plausible that that could occur. And, and um, while recovery or, um, you know, pulling material out of the grouted facility is difficult, it's not impossible. So uh, while it's an unlikely event, um, that, is, uh, that is a feasibility. 
With respect to who pays the, the liability for the waste remains with the government of Canada and, um, and they have the commitment to ensure that any, any post-closure activities uh, are properly funded. Okay, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Juliet. Yeah. Next question is about the gatehouse location. So the gatehouse seems to be located northwest of the reactor building. Since our most common winds come from that direction, I don't understand why this gatehouse would be a suitable location for air quality testing. Any contaminants would blow away from the building. So Juliet, I think that one is for you. Yeah, so um, it was determined through the modeling, the air quality mod modeling that the guardhouse location is the area with the highest concentration in air. So that's uh, why uh, monitoring would take place there. And then um, in this general area, the wind follows the river and it blows almost equally upstream and downstream. Um, and then also we would have on top of that visual monitoring, which would help us with um, uh, monitoring um, around the site as well. So that's the rationale for locating the uh, main monitoring location at the guardhouse. Thanks, Juliet. Okay, the next question is about the institutional control period. If I heard correctly, Ms. Louise stated that to end the institutional control period requires regulatory approval. What is the nature of that approval? So Brian, do you wanna take that question? Yeah, absolutely. So um, even after closure of the site, um, the facility would remain under a Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission license. And um, part of that license would be to uh, review the ongoing performance of the post-closure monitoring program. And um, really the decision point is that a license would not be discontinued until uh, the facility has reached um, a, um, a, a clearance level. And so the, I don't think it probably would be a license hearing, but nonetheless, it would be a regulatory um, um, a decision that would choose when to terminate institutional controls or, and for that matter, to make any modifications to the institutional control program. Okay, thanks, Brian. So we have a question on baseline monitoring. Ms. Louise stated that the baseline monitoring will begin in 2021. What happened to the results from all monitoring that has occurred at the site since the site was placed in storage with surveillance in 1987? Yeah, I can, I can answer this question. So we do have that data as well, and that's also considered part of our baseline data. A lot of that data is summarized in our environmental impact statement, uh, specifically chapter eight. And um, uh, monitoring data for every year is also summarized in an annual compliance monitoring report that's submitted to the CNSC on an annual basis. And past results from uh, the past are outlined in annual compliance mo uh, monitoring reports, and that's in, summarized in our EIS as well. I might just jump in and just add to, to Juliet's response there. Uh, I think the question was, um, there, there was a note in the presentation uh, about um, baseline monitoring starting in 2021, and I think that was tied to groundwater or possibly surface water. Uh, and the reason that, that that's flagged in there is uh, part of what we need to do now uh, before we start the project is uh, begin sampling at the locations and at the frequencies that we're going to use in the um, follow-up monitoring for the decommissioning execution and the uh, institutional control phase. And although we absolutely have uh, decades of data for monitoring the site uh, throughout the storage with surveillance phase, we do want to get um, initial results at the key locations where we're going to con continue monitoring into the future. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Juliet. Okay, the next question is related to that. It is, what is the period of institutional control? Will the same monitoring continue throughout? Juliet, did you want to take that one? I'm sure. Uh, so the uh, period of institutional control is a minimum of 100 years. Um, and uh, monitoring will continue throughout the institutional control period. 
it will likely likely be longer than 100 years. And um, the same monitoring will continue throughout, but during the annual review, if additional monitoring is required, uh, we can modify the, uh, the monitoring that takes place um, to make sure that any changes in the environment is appropriately captured. Thanks, Julia. Okay, so the next question my, um, is asking if levels do exceed levels after more monitoring levels, what are the plans? Unlikely, maybe, but what are the contingency plans? Uh, the government of Canada means taxpayers. If you do this and it does not work, really, we need more concrete answers on this if you do in situ decom right next to the river when IAEA does not recommend this method of decom. So I think there's a couple questions in this to unpack. So um, why don't we turn it over to Brian first and then perhaps uh, Juliet? Uh, yeah, I'm just rereading the question to make sure I un interpret it correctly. Um, um, I'm not sure if more information was needed about contingency plans. Those are, um, I mean, those are built into um, the overall project plan and those are uh, uh, evaluated in depth in the environmental impact statement about uh, the performance of the facility and the uh, normal evolution as well as uh, scenarios that could occur that might impact the facility. So I think those are, are well documented in the environmental impact statement. Um, and there's high confidence that the facility will uh, perform the way it is. Ultimately, the reason this facility and this uh, pro proposed approach will ensure that uh, contaminants uh, do not make their way to the environment at a level that will impact the environment is because uh, the vast majority of the remaining contaminants are trapped within uh, metals such as stainless steel and uh, zirconium. And those take um, uh, literally thousands of years to corrode to even make the materials available for transport out of the facility. Uh, so while the question is good, you know, uh, what, what could go wrong? What are the contingency plans? Um, CNL, I think, has done a good job in describing that in the environmental impact statement. Um, the, the next one of the other statements made by the uh, by the person posting the question is IAEA does not recommend this method of decommissioning and um, uh, that's true that in one of the IAEA documents in the uh, opening parts of the document it, it says that entombment which is um, is often described as as what we would call in situ decommissioning um, is not a recommended planned approach it's mostly uh, recommended for situations of an emergent accident, which clearly this is not. This has been a controlled uh, shutdown of this facility and it's in a safe state now. Um, the rest of the document, uh, the IA document goes on to describe what the methodology is to uh, address um, the strategic decisions to go about decommissioning a facility and what would go into an evaluation of the safety case. Uh, and CNL has done that and has addressed uh, each of the main points in that particular IAEA guidance document. Um, and, and we have that um, uh, described in a document and, and could, could uh, share that with the, with the public, uh, anyone that's interested to see those details. So um, in Canada, the regulator, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission expects the proponent to prove that uh, the project proposed is safe and protective of the environment. And, and that's what CNL will do in this case. So we have a safety case available and uh, specific uh, information on the IEA question if, if uh, desired. Okay, thanks, Brian. And I think one of our previous webinars uh, that is posted on our YouTube channel uh, it also covers the IAEA um, in situ discussion more thoroughly. So if, yeah. if you're interested in that, that's definitely a good place to check it out. I can link that in the chat. So our next question is 
um, about institutional control and it's a follow-up question. So I think this goes to you too, Brian. Is the license that Mr. Wilcox referring to a license to abandon? I think that's actually a question that our, our regulator would have to answer specifically. I, I think that if there is an, uh, an abandonment uh, or a uh, determination made in the future well after institutional control period is complete, then essentially that is um, a license to abandon, but I'm not sure that that's uh, the correct terminology used by the, the regulator today um, regarding what that process is. So I, I don't, I feel like I'm not giving you a clear answer and, and my apologies for that, but uh, I don't know the actual details of uh, what that regulatory decision would be um, and that would be made by the CNSC. So we could certainly follow up and provide that information uh, after the seminar um, to, um, to everybody that participated. Okay, thanks, Brian. So we don't have any more questions in the queue right now. So I will go ahead. Oh, uh, we have a comment though. Uh, I think it's called release from CNSC regulatory control. I think you, you kind of spoke to that, Brian. So I'm going to do our final poll and please feel free if you have any further questions during, during this time, then, then just put it in the Q&A and we'll get to it. Okay, so our, our final poll is just to get a sense of um, whether this was an informative webinar for everybody here today. And uh, we're really interested in your feedback on the webinar and how we're doing things, how good we're doing or how bad we're doing at communicating to our communities. So really interested in hearing your feedback here. And we also have a follow-up survey that will go out with a little follow-up package that directs you to the YouTube link to this webinar. And I'll also put the survey in the chat too. Okay. And we also will be doing our next webinar in April. So we'll do that probably mid-April and we'll send more information out to everybody then. And I just uh, linked the webinar survey and I'm going to, 84% have voted. So I'm gonna end the polling and I'll share the results. So it looks like most attendees here today were pretty satisfied. So we appreciate that feedback and thank you. Oh, and it looks like we have a couple more questions. So I'll... Okay, so uh, Ms. Louise stated that the baseline monitoring will begin in 2021. What happened to the results from, oh, we've done that one, sorry. Yeah, I think we covered that one, sorry. Um, so the, the question is, when does grouting begin, please? So Katie, do you wanna take that question? Yeah, no problem. I can take that. Uh, so that goes back to our timeline, which Juliet um, had up earlier on the call. Um, what now? What we are predicting right now is that we would have a two-part uh, license hearing in 2022, uh, and we obviously need CNSC approval on both the EA and the license piece to go ahead with the decommissioning, which includes the grouting. So the very earliest uh, we would anticipate that grouting could begin would be uh, the fall of 2022. Okay, thanks Katie. And if there are no further questions right now, it's 10 to two. So I think we'll close this webinar and thank you again, everybody for joining. We really appreciate uh, all of you taking the time today to join us. So. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.